Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Institute of Politics. Um, my name is Saba Merzad, and I'm a sophomore at the college studying computer science and government. And I'm the co-president of the Harvard College Iranian Association and chair of the Women's Initiative and Leadership at the IOP. I'm a proud Iranian American and member of the vibrant Iranian community on Long Island. I grew up hearing stories of life in Iran before and after the 1979 revolution. My father was a student at Sharif University, the hub of student protests in the 70s and today when Ayatollah Khomeini first came into power. I learned about some of the bravest young women the world could find leading protests and giving up their lives for a better Iran. When Zina Masa Amini was killed, I could not help but compare her situation to those of the thousands of women who died 40 years ago. Like many students around the world, I wanted to help the cause and elevate voices of Iranian women and people. In September and October, I helped organize rallies at Harvard in support of the Women, Life, Freedom pro um, protests. Today, I'm honored to present our panel to discuss the status of women, life, freedom movement in Iran and to look ahead at the future of the country. Nega Angha is an associate vice president with the Cohen Group and brings nearly two decades of experience advising the US Department of State and National Security Council leadership on matters of policy development and strategic communication. Prior to joining the Cohen Group in 2021, Ms. Angha was the director for multilateral initiatives at the National Security Council. Next, Jason Rezion writes for the Washington Post Global Opinion section. Previously, he was the Post Tehran Bureau Chief from 2012 to 2016. In July 2014, he was arrested by Iranian authorities and imprisoned for 544 days until his release in January 2016. Jason and Nega are both resident fellows at the IOP this semester. And today's panel will be co-moderated by Sadi Warren and Alice Khayami. Alice Khayami is a sophomore at the college studying applied math with the secondary in government. Growing up in an Iranian and French household, Alice has always been invested in international relations, specifically in American foreign policy. Alice is also passionate about human rights activism, and she hopes to study law to pursue a career in public service. At Harvard, Alice is my co-president of the Harvard College Iranian Association and member of the student committee at the JFK Junior Forum. Sadi Warren is the interim director of the Institute of Politics at the Harvard Kennedy School. Prior to this role, he served as executive director of the Shorenstein Center of Media, Policy, and Public Policy. Politics and Public Policies, excuse me. He previously served as mayor of Newton, Massachusetts from 2010 to 2018, and was the first African American to be po a popularly elected mayor in Massachusetts. Prior to running for mayor, Warren completed a year-long tour of duty in Iraq as a naval intelligence specialist. Please join me in a round of applause welcoming our panel. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and thank you to our wonderful fellows for being here. Um, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, arrests and executions have terrorized Iranians since September. Um, the protests in Iran and through the diaspora have not stopped, but this is not the first time that we've seen something like this. Why is this time different? Is it different? Um, and what would be the catalyst for change, uh, for regime change in Iran? Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kick us off. First, I wanted to say thank you. Um, truly, thank you to Alice and, and Saba for, for encouraging and putting this together. I think it's a really, really timely um, discussion and dialogue. And thanks to everyone who's joined tonight, because I do think um, we need to have these kinds of discussions and dialogue on what's happening um, with uh, the Iranian citizens and the atrocities that they are um, uh, are, are feeling by, by the Iranian regime. Um, I think if you were to look at sort of historically what's been happening, um, especially since, since 2009 and even prior to that, there's been a series 
of movements that have occurred and have picked up steam. But I think, and, and I would love to actually hear, not to turn the question around on you, Alice, but I would love to hear your take, especially. I think one of the things that we've seen um, over the last several months is sort of the role that uh, Generation Z have played in, in this, um, essentially this revolution um, and, and these protests. I think one of the things that we need to take into consideration is that we're in a globalized world now, um, and, and the, the Gen Z of Iran have access to, to social media and, um, and the internet, albeit through circumvention of, of the, the restrictions that they're faced. I mean, 35% of the most popular websites are restricted by the Iranian regime, but they've learned ways to access it. They have the same wants and needs as the Generation Z around the world, this sort of globalized genera uh, Generation Z. Um, and they're, they're essentially put in this really tough spot by the Iranian regime. They, they have no hope, they have no options, and so they essentially talk about two options. We either have to leave Iran and, and join the brain drain that um, has occurred in Iran, or, um, uh, or we rise up, and they rised up. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I'll, I'll piggyback off of uh, what Negar said. Um, first of all, arrests and executions have been a function of the Islamic Republic since the day that it started. Um, and the rate at which people were arrested uh, in recent months was uh, pretty astounding, even by their own standards. And executions were pretty swift in uh, several cases of protesters that were, uh, were, were, were I, I hasten to use the word execution because it's more of an extrajudicial killing that, that happens in these cases. These are not people that have been put on any kind of meaningful trial, excuse me, um, they've not been given due process, there's no witnesses in these cases against them, there's no real crime, right, their only crime is uh, exercising their, their universal right to dissent. Um, and the judgment and the enactment of these convictions uh, isn't isn't intended to punish. It's intended to deter other people from joining protests. Uh, and that's been a function of the Islamic Republic since the very beginning. Um, you ask what's different this time. I think what's really different is a coalescing of different groups within Iranian society. Of course, you have 50% uh, of the, the society, women, who are subjugated, who are considered less valuable than men in the eyes of the law but also ethnic minorities, religious minorities. So large groups within Iranian society that feel disenfranchised, that have very legitimate demands and expectations that aren't being met. And I know it's unpopular uh, or maybe not spoken about very much, but for many years, for the first 25 years or so of the Islamic Republic, they were able to service the basic needs of people. The university, uh, that Sabah's father, Sharif University, still turns out the best engineers uh, in the world. It's, it's still there, it's still operating. Um, and the way that, that the regime has been able to service people is through oil sales. They're not able to sell their oil at the same clip as they, are, as they were previously because of sanctions. So the whole machinery is starting to kind of break down. Um, but ultimately, uh, the Islamic Republic doesn't have answers for any of these demands of people. So I think that we will see, continue to see cycles of uprising over the months and years ahead. Uh, but what it is that'll be that catalyst to, to ultimately bring down the Islamic Republic, I think that, that um, I would be unwise to guess. Great. I'd also like to echo the welcoming to the forum uh, this evening, everyone in the audience, and to our two fabulous fellows and Alice, um, our undergraduate leader here at the IOP. Um, I want to go to a more global question with you, Naga. Given your background in international diplomacy, do you think there is the possibility for any foreign pressure from the international community to heavily influence the Iranian government? a very good question. Um, 
you know, it, it's interesting when you, you think about sort of first sort of taking the question and, and the observation of where the Iranian regime is right now. Um, they are in a position um, and they've gone full hard line um, in, in their rhetoric and, and in their tactics. Um, and this isn't new, this has been a, a few years in the making. Um, and some of the best examples is, for example, in, in 2020 when um, they had their parliamentary elections, um, the, the Guardian Council essentially, who, which does a lot of the vetting, vetted out all the reformist uh, voices. Um, and the same thing was engineered for, for the presidential elections. Um, and uh, so the following year you had Rahim Raisi, um, the current president sort of essentially engineered and uh, elected in the same way. So you have this very hard line set of tactics right now. Um, so I think, uh, I mean, in many ways, the, the calculus and the tactics have changed. They, they are going to continue to be um, operating in this very hard line momentum. I think when you kind of pull it out a little bit and look at it from this international scope. I mean, uh, since the, the protests occurred, you have seen um, the, the US government, its allies um, out in terms of, of enforcing more and more sanctions um, against Iran and the Iranian regime um, for the human rights abuses, the executions, um, the, the, the funding of, of terrorist organizations. Um, you even saw the EU considering whether or not to, um, uh, to place um, IRGC as, uh, designate IRGC as a terrorist organization. Um, but you've, you've seen the momentum pick up, obviously, in, in response to how, um, how hardline and um, how much the Iranian regime is doubling down. Um, you know, I would, would be curious to see what Jason's thoughts were, but one thing I would add is, which I find um, super fascinating as I observe all of this, fascinating in a bad way, not necessarily in a good way, but um, what we've seen is especially you know, post uh, when the United States under the last administration decided to withdraw from the JCPOA negotiations in 2018, um, we saw quite a bit, and I'm not sure if this was part of the administration's calculus at the time or not, or, or considered in their calculus, but uh, Iran and, and this hardline regime has moved closer towards the East, closer towards Russia, closer towards China. Um, we saw uh, in 2020, um, Iran signed a 25-year security agreement um, or strategic agreement with China. Raisi was in China yesterday. Um, we obviously have seen Russia create um, a defense uh, agreement with um, Iran and Russia have created a defense agreement and there was an Iranian delegation in Russia recently talking about um, uh, sort of arms um, and it's it's kind of ironic when you think about it when Khomeini first uh, came to power, one of the things he said is na shar, na garb, um, neither east or west. Yeah. Um, and you see the current hardline um, Iranian regime double down on, on moving eastward um, and, and these relationships, which will naturally have ramifications, um, not just within the region, but also within a multilateral setting like the UN Security Council. So if something were to occur, and if we were to, to take it to, for example, the US government, take it to, to the UN, Iran has uh, two vetoes. It could um, uh, hide behind China and, and Russia, um, but that was very long-winded, um, so I'll leave it at that. Oh, that was great. Jason, did you want to add to that? or? Um, no, but I think the, the one thing that I would say is that the, that, that that China piece is so important. And when they when they signed that deal three years ago, uh, and I wrote about it, people said, "No, oh, this is irrelevant. This is not uh, going to be an issue." Um, and now, you know, not only has their relationship with China deepened, Iran is selling drones to uh, to Russia that are being used in in Ukraine right now, um, and. Again, you know, my thought at the time when, when I heard that news several months ago was that, um, well, you know, Iranian drones are not going to be that sophisticated. This can't be uh, a major security threat. Well, actually, 
they're so unsophisticated that they literally fly under the radars and are a huge problem for, uh, for Ukraine, but also for the United States, potentially in other uh, fronts. So, you know, what Iran uh, lacks in, in resources, uh, they've been able to fortify themselves with um, sort of asymmetrical means uh, of addressing problems, whether it's in the, in the war space or in the diplomatic space, the use of hostage taking and, and other um, unacceptable methods. I'm gonna turn it over to Alice, but it sounds like um, that's a high bar for, for international pressure to create change with all the factors you just mentioned. Is that? Look, I mean, I think the bar is quite high, uh, but what I would say is that Iran needs relationships with other countries, Not the same whether way. it's yeah. China, Russia. Yeah. Uh, and we've seen uh, over, over the years that outside pressure has worked. Uh, but, um, you know, in the, in the current context, U.S. and Iran have not had direct relations for 43 years. Um, it's rather difficult for the, for the U.S. To, to make meaningful demands uh, from a country that uh, it doesn't actually talk to. Yeah, I'd love to go off of this and just hear a little bit more about like, the perception of Iran. So I know as an American Iranian myself, the views on Iran can tremendous differently coming from Iranians, coming from Americans. Nagar, you yourself never lived in Iran, but you were able to witness the revolution from abroad um, and the changes that came after that. Jason, you lived there, you worked there, you were a hostage there for 544 days. Um, so I'd love to know how you perceive Nagar Iran, maybe from an external point of view, um, and then Jason, if that outsider's perspective is, is valid or is it very different what goes on there than how we perceive it here in the yeah. U.S.? Uh, so I will say, I think for me, it, you know, your, your point exactly, being born in, in the U.S., I was born at a time when uh, the, the images of Iran on TV were were terrible. Um, and so the, the impressions of Iran were, were not of my, the generation prior to me, the sort of, this, this great grand Iran. Um, and so, and I grew up in a, in a household where, um, and again, this was in a different era before the satellites, but there was this one, um, Iranian newscast that would come on public television. I think it was like 7, 7.30 in the morning. It was right before I was going to school. So it was on every single morning, um, Monday through Friday. And we were tracking it. The news was on. We were tracking everything um, that was transpiring. Um, so growing up, there was... There was, that was happening on TV. I was part of a, a society that had this nostalgia for Iran. So even when you would go to Farsi school, there were all these stories of the good old days, or, and depending on how, many how, how much older people were from me, um, hearing uh, the music and the story. So I think there's a bit of me in terms of that nostalgia of wanting to, to go to Iran one day um, when it's, it, it's feasible because you kind of want to be able to see that. I've traveled throughout the Middle East, but never to Iran. Um, and I kind of want to be able to, to explore that. Now, granted, I get to, to be exposed to quite a bit of, of Iranian Americans um, being from California. Um, so there's, there's that flavor. Um, I think in terms of the, the outside observer, as you noted, I think um, for myself, I think I'm, I'm fairly well read in terms of what's happening in Iran, whether it was the, the briefing materials I would um, read while, uh, while working, whether it was, you know, reading books and, and observations of people like Jason who, who were uh, living in, in Iran and, and coming at it from a perspective having lived in the United States. Um, and, and being able, I think I, I complement my understanding with um, experts, whether in, in academia or in the think tank world, who do have conversations with people tr who travel back and forth. Um, and, and I think there is a luxury to be able to travel back and forth and be able to share the information because so much happens and changes on a regular basis. So even if you lived in Iran three years ago, your information's a little bit old if you're not able to travel back and forth, if you're not able to stay in touch with people. 
that whole notion of, of you know, the information becoming stale was something that I always had in the back of my mind when I lived there. And um, I was pretty confident that if and when I left Iran, I would stop writing about it um, because I wouldn't have that kind of uh, direct connection to it. Um, and that changed pretty quickly because I realized that not only um, was nobody else who was writing on Iran actually going there, some of them had never been there before. Um, and that's not a strike against somebody, but, um, but certainly my experience of, um, of going there many times before I moved there, over almost a decade long period, until I moved there and lived and worked there, married a woman from there, um, dealt with the bureaucracy of life there, uh, did arguably one of the hardest jobs bureaucratically um, as a journalist there, and then spent a year and a half you know, in their prison system. Um, I feel like I'm pretty well qualified to keep talking about it for a while. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, to me, uh, I had a little bit of that nostalgia uh, before I ever went there. But my dad had come to the United States to go to school uh, in the late 50s um, and married my mom, who was from the Midwest. Over time, lots of his relatives moved to California, so we were around uh, Iranian people from from the you know the very start of my life. And as Nega pointed out, I mean the the perceptions of it, the representations of Iran on television, especially, were so different than the people that I um, was encountering in my own life. And then you know, as I got older and would read the news. So much of our coverage of, of Iran is really just reamplifying what the leaders of that country would have to say. Same thing with Cuba, same thing with China, same thing with Russia. So I went there with this real challenge of trying to, personal challenge, of trying to take this place that uh, feels very far away, that Americans have decided uh, is un unknowable. Um, and try and make it accessible to, to American readers. That, that's what I tried to do. Jason, um, I want to stay with you. You know, you referenced you were incarcerated for 544 days. Do you know the fate of the other Iranian prisoners who are left behind? In part two, this is, with the recent events and punishing hard lines adopted by the Iranian regime, has their chance for being liberated become worse or better? Um, I do know the fate of uh, the three Americans who are still being um, held right now. One of them, Siamak Namazi, was arrested uh, about four months before I was released and was not part of the deal that that um, that released me and. Um, so, you know, he's, he's been in prison for almost eight years now. Mm. Uh, there's two other uh, Iranian-American men uh, who uh, have been in prison for shorter periods of time. I know that the three of them are being housed together now. Um, and I know that that's a, a major um, psychological step forward for them. Uh, there was a report today that, uh, that there are uh, are possibly secret negotiations going on uh, for their uh, release. I hope that's, that that's true. Um, and I know that there are channels open between um, friendly governments, the UK, Swiss, Qatari governments uh, have acted as go-betweens between the US and Iran in the past. I think that the window uh, for getting them out gets more and more difficult the more time goes on. And um, one of the things that we talk about in my study group is the rising uh, tide of 
foreign states taking Americans hostage. Uh, and there are all sorts of um, theories about how to deal with those, those situations. And as I told my group last night, uh, as a survivor of one of those situations, uh, my first priority is figure out what you need to do to bring these fellow Americans home as quickly and safely as possible, uh, but concurrently uh, come up with, with ways to deter the, the behavior uh, in the future, which um, sounds maybe easier than, uh, than, than it has been in practice to figure out. This has been going on for thousands of years, and um, hopefully in our lifetimes we'll see the end of it. Thank you. Um, we certainly have um, an incredible story. I, I do remember following your release with my mom, with my sister at home, so um, it, it is incredible to, to have you here tonight. Um, before I ask my next question, I also just want to let everyone know that we're going to open up the floor to questions in a moment. Um, there are four microphones around the forum, um, so you can go ahead and line up. Uh, before you ask your question, please introduce yourself, say your affiliation to um, Harvard. Um, please keep the questions brief and remember that a question always ends with a question mark. Um, so I just want to ask also as a student myself with students here, um, I'm really inspired by the amount of young adults that are participating in the movements in Iran, but also abroad. Um, so could you share a little bit more about how students are really involved in this movement? Um, what are they doing to try to foster change? Are they being successful in Iran, um, in the US, and in, in Europe, around the world? Can go a little bit first. Go for it. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a long history of Iranian students uh, mobilizing, going back to, to the 60s and 70s here in the US. Um, they had a really important role to play. I mean, people forget that the revolution in 1979 uh, was, uh, you know, the outcome of, of, of the revolution wasn't the intended one uh, that most people uh, in Iran were, were hoping for. Um, and, you know, I think that, that students now have played as much of an integral role uh, as ever before. One of the interesting things that, uh, that I saw early on during the protest was an interview with a top official who very candidly said that he had spoken to um, a colleague who was uh, an intelligence ministry interrogator. And uh, that uh, this interrogator said that the interrogations of the students that they've arrested are the hardest he's ever done in his career. And the reason was that he said, they have no idea what I'm talking about, and I have no idea what they're talking about. There's a real disconnect inside Iranian society. Nega pointed out uh, the internet penetration in Iran is incredibly high for a country where there's so many restrictions on the kind of information that people can access, but they figure out ways to access it. They're listening to the same music, watching the same movies, thinking about the same things that you guys are. And the leaders of that country are not. Um, and I think one of the things that the Islamic Republic has really um, miscalculated or, or, or maybe not even noticed. Uh, the fact that this has been largely woman-led is not something that the Western world, that the United States and our allies can refuse to get behind. And it's not something that the Islamic Republic even has the vocabulary to uh, ever understand. Yeah, just to, to add to a bit of color to what Jason was saying, I mean, I, I would say even the generation that is of, of Jason and, and myself, um, you know, one of the arguments that I was hearing, hearing from folks was that, why couldn't we do it? Why didn't we have the ability to create such a, such a movement um, where it instills such a not only globalized movement, but you know this potential conversation of this being a, a revolution um, and that needs to be addressed by the international community. Um, but there is something to be said, I mean, going back to my original point about Generation Z, there is something to be said for that and, and this globalized nature. Um, 
And, and as you pointed out, the diaspora even here, I think there is that connection that's occurring through social media um, and, and wanting to be supportive. I mean, even going back to, and I don't have the statistics off the top of my head, but that song that became the song of, of this, essentially of this revolution, of this uprising, Baroye, which won the Grammys, Grammys? Yes. Grammys. Um, is in and of itself a statement um, of, of again where where this generation Z is is focused and where they're connected and how they're be able to bring change. Um, so I would just I think that's the piece that I would want to double down um, on is that I think so much of this is is the generation Z, the women, the girls, the men in support of the women. Um, I don't know, you know, if you, you see some of the images, there are 10 year old girls out on the streets. I mean, this is this is a, a movement um, and it's not just in Iran where their lives are at stake, but you see them in, in the protests um, around the world um, and in, in all the major cities. Great, okay, let's get started with questions from the floor. We'll start over here. Yeah, absolutely. You guys hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome. Uh, thank you very much for the very informative forum. Uh, my name is Ahmed. Uh, I'm a junior studying government. Uh, and my question to you is about Iran's domestic politics. So in response to the protests in Iran, Ali Khamenei has called the protests um, a conspiracy being waged by the enemies of Iran. Uh, now, this sounded very familiar to me. Um, a lot of neighboring countries, the regimes of neighboring countries have also called it a conspiracy against their countries. Uh, same with Syria, uh, Libya. So my question to you is, how do you strike a balance between the desire for freedom, for democracy, for regime change, with what I think are legitimate fears of becoming a failed state, uh, of being replaced by a public government? Yeah, um, great question. I, you know, I, I, I was talking to, um, uh, somebody at the National Security Council recently uh, about this very issue of, uh, you know, they're going to blame it on us, right? Um, and if you remember in 2009, um, the Obama administration didn't come out in support of the Green Movement for that very reason, because they didn't want to be seen as uh, meddling in Iranian politics and it would make it worse for protesters that were arrested. Um, Obama recently, in the last couple months, say, said that he regretted not supporting that movement, that it was a mistake. And what I told the, this um, NSC director was that whatever you do, they're going to blame it on you. Whatever you don't do, they're going to blame it on you, right? This is the function of, of uh, authoritarian states. They have to have an enemy uh, to blame things on when, when they can't. Uh, do right. As to whether or not Iran is going to become a failed state, I mean, I think that's the concern of lots and lots of people. And as you know, uh, if Iran fails, uh, it's going to have massive geopolitical consequences throughout the entire region. Um, it's been very interesting to watch how Saudi Arabia uh, has dealt with the situation inside Iran. Uh, through def various media outlets. But, you know, the last thing that Saudi Arabia wants to see is a free and democratic Iran, right? They might not like the Islamic Republic and they might like to see Iran devolve into sectarian violence and, and ethnic violence and civil war. Uh, but, you know, what sort of model would that be for them to have a, a democratic Iran on the other side of the Persian Gulf? Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a very tough situation. I think they covered it. Did yep. you want to add anything? Or you? No, I okay. think. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, go over here. Hi, my name is Spencer. Uh, I'm a sophomore at the college. Uh, my question was just that we spoke a lot today about the role of foreign governments in this relation. I'm just curious what you think we all can do as college students to sort of aid and assist in these efforts. I mean, I, again, I would follow, observe, write, um, support, support your, your fellow um, 
your fellow essentially uh, students who are out there protesting. I think that is the most important thing. Um, stay smart on the issues. This, without the attention of, of people around the world, the issue will fade away. Um, all of the, the lives lost, the, the people who have been in tortured, who've lost their eyes, who've lost their lives, that um, it, it essentially becomes all for nothing. So if you continue to stay smart and, um, and follow the issues and support them, whether it's through writing articles, elevating the issue, um, I think uh, you, will, you will do your part. I also, think, I also think it's really important to actively um, call on the, the U.S. government to um, reopen uh, student visas for Iranians. Officially, they have, uh, but if you look back over the history uh, of U.S.-Iran relations before the uh, revolution in 1979, uh, from the late 60s until the late 70s, there are more Iranians studying at U.S. colleges than, than people of any other nationality. And even after the revolution, that, that remained you know, pretty consistent. Um, I was at Stanford uh, in 2019, um, and it was the first year uh, in several decades that not a single Iranian was able to come to to uh, study at Stanford. I'm guessing that at Harvard it was a similar scenario. Uh, in a normal year, about 100 Iranian students would come at the graduate and undergraduate level uh, to continue their educations here. And that's a really important point of connection that, that we need to be um, nurturing. And I think that you guys can play a role in that. Um, and uh, it, w it would be a, a good, civic activity to, to get involved in, in pushing Congress to, to work on that. That's great, thank you. Let's go up here. Hello, my name is Ciara. I am a student at Harvard Divinity School and the Fletcher School at Tufts. Uh, my question is, as an Iranian American, I have been following everything very, very closely every day. Um, but one thing I've struggled with is how can we find the nuance of uplifting women life freedom and the calls of the Iranian people while also ensuring that those who are covering Iran and whether in the media space or in foreign policy are not um, su supporting women life freedom through Islamophobic narratives and analyses or um, by kind of ignoring the West's understanding or the Western intervention in, pa in past and calling for regime change in a maybe less nuanced way. I would love to just hear both of your perspectives deeply rooted in, in these spaces of what the conversation has been and has it been done justice to talk about Iran without falling in those traps. I mean, I think that's an excellent question. Um, uh, I'll actually be curious to hear what Jason has to say since um, given, given his profession, but I think it's important. I think, again, going back to what I said earlier, I think um, having the conversation, having people like Jason writing these pieces, um, keeping, whether it's the foreign policy world um, smart, keeping the, the policymakers smart on the issues so they don't fall uh, through, through various rabbit holes um, so that their perspective isn't skewed. But I truly do think this is where, um, again, having these, these uh, whether it's news articles, the press, the academic pieces that come out, these are really important. These do feed into the, the policy discussion. This does make, again, policymakers smart so they don't fall down those, those rabbit holes that you mentioned. When it comes to how um, the, the current movement has been covered, there's been a lot of criticism of uh, media coverage, newspaper coverage in particular. Um, I'm all for criticizing the media, um, <laughs> but this is one of these instances where um, our hands are really tied, right? You know, we, they're, they're, they're in a the single uh, independent Western journalist inside Iran right now. And I've been in, involved in all sorts of uh, discussions on the record and off the record. People saying, well, you know, I got a cousin in Tehran and they're sending me videos. You know what? 
Washington Post can't just, you know, publish a video that somebody's cousin said that they sent from Iran, right? It doesn't work like that. We, we have levers of uh, fact-checking and, and, and vetting that, that have, have to be done. Um, another common complaint people have had for the last few months is, why isn't the movement in Iran getting the same kind of attention as the war in Ukraine? Well, Ukraine is a NATO ally, right? Um, Iran is a country on the other side of the world where, again, we don't have any journalists in. Washington Post hasn't had anybody working in Iran since the day I was arrested eight and a half years ago. I think we probably have a dozen people in Ukraine and have had a dozen people in Ukraine since the very first day of the war, and we will continue to have somebody there because Ukraine wants us there. So we have to look at, first of all, who the, the culprit in this is, and it's the Islamic Republic. Um, another thing that I want to say is that, you know, when you're, when you're looking at, at the, the, the news coverage, the, the, the journalism that's being produced right now is really spectacular because we have different kinds of tools and resources available to us. And one of the things that the Washington Post and the New York Times are doing incredibly well are what we call uh, digital forensic in investigations. Uh, and we've done probably five so far uh, on different protests where we're taking videos from different locations using geolocating software to, to figure out exact places where things happen down to where a bullet comes from, right? If, if, if there were these kinds of cell phone cameras in 1963, we would know who shot JFK and there wouldn't be any doubt about it. But these things don't, you know, we can't put them out in a matter of hours. It takes days and weeks and resources. Um, and so, you know, I would just say, give us a little bit of time, but I think we're doing a pretty good job. Okay. Let's go over here. <clears throat> thank you both for coming to speak with us, and thank you, Alice and Seti, for um, moderating this. My name is Toby. I'm a second year student at the college studying history and government, and my question is for Jason. Um, I don't think I've ever met someone who's been to prison, and I understand it must be a sensitive subject, but I wanted to ask, what were you in prison for? What was the experience like for you? And how did that change your opinion on Iran or its government? We got 17 minutes and... Uh, <laughs> um, what was the first part? What, was what were you in prison for? for? Because I was there. You know, because I was American, I was there. I mean, they, they, you know, publicly accused me of being a spy for the U.S. government, but nobody actually believed that. Um, you know, they have a long track record of taking U.S. and other foreign nationals, particularly ones with the second Iranian nationality hostage, and then using us as leverage in negotiations. And that was, you know, the classic example of what happened to me. Um, the prison experience, look, I spent 49 days in solitary confinement at the beginning. Uh, my wife and I were uh, abducted at gunpoint from our home. Um, for the first 35 days, I had no idea where she was, what had been done to her. She was also being held in sol solitary con confinement, just a few yards away from me, but I didn't know that. Um, and, you know, solitary confinement is designed to make you go crazy uh, so that you will admit to things that you didn't do just to get out of there. Um, and, uh, you know, eight years later, the impact is still very much there. And I, um, I feel like I'm almost back to myself. But, you know, that little voice that you have in your head, um, it finally reminds me of the one that was there before all this happened to me. But I, there are little things that, that will never um, go back. I mean, I was just in a restaurant the other day um, and I was seated um, with my back to the rest of the restaurant. And so many of my interrogations were done blindfolded with, from people behind me. I can't sit like that. Right, like you know, if you want me, to, if 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 you and I ever sit down to have a coffee or a meal, let me look out uh, at the at the room at at the 
at the door know where my exit is because otherwise I'm just like a caged animal. Honestly, I go back to that still after all these years. Um, so yeah, it's had a profound impact on me, on my relationships, my entire community. Um, and that's the reason why I spend so much time reporting on these cases because it's a really, really extreme abuse of power that, um, that destroys people. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, yeah, Jason. Sure. We'll go down here. Hi, my name is Helen, and I work at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy here at the Kennedy School. Thank you for being here. Jason, you mentioned that you wanted to see the Iranian authorities deterred from imprisoning people like you in the future. And I was wondering what sorts of strategies or policies you would like to see American policymakers um, and diplomats implement in order to deter the Iranian authorities yeah, from I mean, doing I th this. I think that there are, there are a few things that are out there. You know about global Magnitsky sanctions um, that um, target human rights violators. Um, I don't think that those have been used particularly well yet. I mean, it's a new tool. Uh, but um, I think that uh, bilateral relations oftentimes get in the way uh, when it's time to really go after bad actors. Um, and I'd, I'd like to see those uh, used more liberally. Also, the enforcement of judgments against foreign states that do this. I mean, th that's one of the, um, th the key uh, mechanisms. There's a reason that, that federal judges consistently uh, uh, give, give uh, verdicts that are in favor of people who've been held hostage. Hostage taking is an act of terror. Uh, and if terror judgments are not enforced, um, terrorists will keep doing terror. I mean, you know, it, it's pretty simple. So I think the, 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 the tools that are available to us are pretty good. They could be stronger but they need to be used. All right, we'll go over there. Hello, my name is Freddy Guevara. I'm from Venezuela. I'm a fellow at the Kennedy School. Uh, one of the topics that I'm researching is why the latest civil system movements have been failing in the, la in the last years. So I wanted to ask you, why do you think the 2009 Green Revolution and why this actual movement haven't achieved its goal? What are the main pillars of support that um, makes the Iranian regime still stands in power? Can go first. It's an excellent question. Um, I will tackle it, but I, I will seek you, you to compliment it a bit. Um, look, I think um, many times when a revolution is, is successful is that you have the various communities come together and join forces, even if they're disparate across the spectrum of, of the political debate. Um, but they come together, they come together for that one goal. Um, and then there are fissures that occur at, at the top. Um, so far in, in Iran, what we have seen is there are disparate sort of views across the political spectrum. So um, you, you start seeing those, those breaks even amongst people who are, are coming together to, um, to fight a revolution, um, and so hopefully the, that will start to mend um, as as the the protests continue. But we also haven't seen any break or fissures um, at the top. Um, if anything, they continue to double down um, and they continue to uh, grow closer together at the top of of the the Iranian regime. And I think that is one thing that we have have yet to see. Um, any break within within the ranks, um, and so I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I mean, I think the other f factor is that they have no reservations about using brute force. Um, if you remember in 2009, uh, there was a, a young woman whose uh, killing was caught on video, Neda Aga Sultan. Um, and I remember I was in Tehran at that that point and there was a renewed sense of rage but there was also a real s fear that hadn't penetrated even though dozens of people had been 
killed uh, in the streets before she was, to see that and to have that image being blasted around the world, um, it scared people back into their homes. Uh, I think that the, the truth is that, that people had the feeling that, hey, you know what, we still do have something to lose. We don't want to die for this cause. Um, and I think more and more people have given them their lives to this cause, especially over the last few months. And really, tragically and disgustingly, uh, dozens of children have been killed. Uh, and when a regime starts killing you know, the citizens, the, the, the child citizens of their country, there's really no going back. Uh, but as Nego pointed out, um, until there's a breaking of the ranks at the top and within the military in particular, um, and I, I think that that's not going to happen until uh, the, the, the economic hurt is really uh, visceral to uh, people in, in the highest places of power. Until that happens, I, I, I think they'll keep going. Great, thank you. We'll go up here. Hi there, um, I'm Sam. Uh, I'm a student at the law school. And my, I had two questions intertwined, but one of them was essentially answered by asking, how do you think this can lead to a revolution? Um, but in the case that it does lead to a revolution, uh, who do you think is most poised to seize power in the vacuum left by the Islamic Republic? Um, there seems to be a lot of lobbying money uh, uh, behind uh, Mujahideen Ekhal, which is at their core like a Marxist militant organization that has low support across Iran and abroad. Iran has operated as a monarchy for the last 2,500 years, up until recent history. And I believe the elephant in the room is the crown prince Reza Pahlavi. Uh, which has uh, a strong following both in Iran's diasporic community and within Iran's younger population. I think this can be evidenced by an Instagram post made by uh, Majid Reza Rahnavard that was recently executed uh, by the Islamic Republic uh, after a sham trial. Uh, in a post that he made that was captioned uh, with a video of the Shah that said, an entire generation fell in love with you that never knew you. And so I want to ask, do you think it's possible for Iran to become a constitutional monarchy that is essentially largely ceremonial like Japan or the UK? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I think anything's possible. Um, I don't think that that's what most people are asking for at this point. Um, there is a lot of support for Mr. Pahlavi uh, in the diaspora more than probably ever before. Uh, you rightfully pointed out that uh, the Mujahideen Khalq doesn't have much support. I would, I would actually correct you. I, I think they don't have any support. Um, you know, it's a few thousand people scattered around the world um, who have uh, quite a lot of foreign money behind them and are able to, you know, swing policy deba debates among people who don't have relevant experience on the issue. Um, I think it. You know, to me, it seems as though um, in a situation like Iran that has been so isolated for so long, uh, the hope would be that someone would emerge internally. Um, you know, of, of the, the figures in diaspora, uh, none have ever um, managed anything inside the country. Uh, and so it's sort of an unfair ask uh, to, to put that on them. Um, but I think uh, there are a lot of people inside Iran uh, who know the country very well. Um, and there's going to have to be a reckoning when th that day comes uh, because there will be people who have had affiliations with the Islamic Republic uh, that will have to be a part of any future government unless you want to uh, imprison and execute them all. And it, that doesn't seem like a viable path towards uh, a secular democracy in the future. So I just think there's too many challenges and I think it's way too early to, to think about who might that person be. Ryan? Yeah. 
Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Tierney. I'm a student of the college. Uh, Jason, you mentioned earlier that, you know, in uh, autocratic regimes, you always need to have an enemy, someone to blame, uh, someone to cast, uh, cast blame on for internal problems. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, history shows that, you know, internal strife within an autocracy can lead to warfare. Uh, Iran has a natural enemy in Israel, and they have a lot of other enemies in the Western world as well. My question to you is, what is the chance that internal strife within the country could boil over into a larger scale conflict? Wow. Well, I would hope that um, the chances are low, but I think that they've gotten much higher over recent months. You know, there is a lot of talk about um, the strife and, and uh, demands of various ethnic groups. But the one thing that people have been pretty consistent about is their desire to keep territorial integrity. Right? Iran has been Iran for a very long time, and uh, it doesn't matter what ethnic or religious group people come from. In my experience, everybody thinks of themselves as Iranian first, and then whatever it is, uh, whatever hyphen it is after that. Um, you know, the, the, the prospects of a larger conflict that would boil over into other countries is pretty high. And Iran has obviously been involved in Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Afghanistan. Um, and there's been, you know, skirmishes on their own border with Azerbaijan. Um, they've attacked Saudi Arabia oil fields uh, in the last several years. Um, and so I think that that's why this situation is so sensitive and one that um, the U.S. government is taking very seriously. Um, but, you know, I couldn't put, tell you, you know, what the odds are uh, of, of a war breaking out. I hope they're, they're, they're low, though. I'm not a gambler. I, I don't know. <laughs> that, I, that, is a, that is a tough question, but a very good question. And, and to, to Jason's point, I think everyone is very focused on that, making sure there isn't um, a, a spillover as well um, because, because of the region, because of all the issues that Jason just laid out. Thank you. That's great. Well, we're just about at time, so we're going to wrap up. The good news, if you were waiting in line, you can go to their study groups to ask their questions. <laughs> They're going to be here for several weeks. Uh, this has been an incredible evening, enlightening and powerful. Um, Alice, thank you. Jason, thank you. Nagat, thank you. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs>